Well, good morning. I, I was wondering when I got in the car at 4.55 a.m. in the darkness and it was wind chill of about four outside, I wonder if anybody's really going to show up for Bible study. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, we are studying the book of Proverbs together. We are in Proverbs chapter 21, beginning in verse 23. This morning I have five Proverbs. Uh, I don't know if we'll get to all of them, but we'll certainly try. And I want you to set a tab at 2 Samuel 16, because it's going to serve as uh, an excellent lesson for our first proverb, I believe, this morning. So here is uh, Proverbs 21, 23. He who guards his mouth and tongue is one who guards his life from distresses. 21-24, the insolent, presumptuous person, mocker is his name. He behaves with insolent fury. 25, the craving of the sluggard kills him because his hands refuse to work. 26, all day long, he craves greedily, but the righteous give without sparing. And there you can see the connection uh, between 25 and 26. Really, 26 is a further explanation of the life, the way, the style of living of the sluggard. And then finally, 27, the sacrifice of wicked people is an abomination. How much more he brings it with evil intent. Okay, here's what I believe these Proverbs are teaching, and this is the way I'm going to present it. 21-23, careful with words because the pain that they can bring back to you. Careful with words because the pain that they can bring back to you or back upon you. 24, the greatest of the fools. The greatest of the fools. 25, the sluggard dies by his own decisions. The sluggard dies by his own decisions. 26, endless frustration versus daily blessing. Endless frustration versus daily blessing. And finally, 27, wise is the heart of sincere worship. Wise is the heart of sincere worship. So Proverbs 21, 23, and here is our first one and the exposition this morning. Uh, the first thing I want you to notice is the repetition of the word to guard. You have that in your translation of the New American Standard. But your translation may also read the word to keep. This is a proverb of wise speech. The wise and skillful are careful with their words and will not say things that get themselves into trouble. In the previous proverb, our last one that we studied, the wise was the conquering warrior 
of a city. He was aggressive by taking down the walls of a city or a place in the ancient world. But here, the wise is the skillful defender, escaping distresses by guarding his mouth. The top line opens, he who guards. It's the defense of virtue. Mouth and tongue are emphatic in our top line. And many times we have seen in the Proverbs them tied together. They emphasize the necessity of guarding our speech. And look, by doing so, line two, one in fact is guarding his life from distresses. That is in the plural, many manifold miseries. That's the idea. From rash speech, rash words that originate from a corrupt heart. Now, 2 Samuel 16 and verse 8 is a text that I want you to look at with me. Because I've often wondered what was going through the mind of Shimei, the son of Gera, as he hurried down with the men of Judah to greet David after he returns to Jerusalem from conquering his son Absalom and putting down that rebellion? Why, it was just a few days before 2 Samuel 16, 8, here is the words of Shimei. The Lord has avenged on you all the blood of the house of Saul, he said, in whose place you have reigned, and the Lord has given the kingdom into the hands of your son Absalom. See, your evil is on you, for you are a man of blood. Now, Abishai was a great vaunted soldier in David's army, and he was at David's right hand often. And Abishai, upon hearing that, turns to David and says, give me the order and I will sever his head from his torso. I want to point out four things from this passage that are relevant to our proverb. First of all, David did not give him the order. He insulted the king, and yet David let him have a pass. The Lord took me through a very, very painful trial several years back, and I came to realize that it was just important for me to just go through it and not say anything more. I had asked for prayer, I had prayed vigilantly, and I came to the conclusion no, this is just something that the Lord wants me to go through, and I have to go through it by myself. This was the text that the Lord drew me to, because David, his mind, he said, I need to go through this. And a part of going through this was listening to this Fool, make this verbal attack upon him. He didn't give the order. He let him live. Here's a second thing from this text. Look at this 
Look at these words. The Lord has given the kingdom into the hands of your son. You see, fools often talk about things they know nothing about. Nothing. This was the Lord's kingdom. David was the regent of God's kingdom. That's the way David could pray the imprecations in the Psalms. That I hate my enemies with a pure hatred because he was God's vice regent on the earth. This was the Lord's kingdom and David was the man representing the Lord in that kingdom. So an enemy of David is an enemy of the Lord. And that's the way David looked at it. That is part of the Davidic covenant. So, this fool is talking about things he doesn't know anything about. Not a scintilla of truth to what he is saying. Given the kingdom into the hands. It's not for another man to take the kingdom. It's for God to give it. But you can't reason with a fool. And this man and Absalom were both fools. Here's a third thing. Look at these words. See, your evil is on you, for you're a man of blood. You know, it struck me that God, oftentimes, He talks through the mouths of fools. He talked through the mouth of a donkey. He speaks through a tree or a fire. Here is this fool, and he's giving us a prophetic word. It's not going to be about David, but it's about David's ultimate son. Look at that. Evil is on you. Well, the evil of sinners is going to come upon the son of David, the ultimate son. It's not going to be the sins of the world. No, it's the sins of the sheep, of the righteous. Those sins fall upon the son. And the son, by his blood, you're a man of blood. He will be the man of blood. And it will be by that blood that the righteous will be cleansed, expiated of their sin. I thought that was very striking. So, no, David spares the fool who shoots his mouth off. He does it for a reason. Two weeks ago, Jeff Brown preached a marvelous message for us. And he said something that I thought was so well framed that our trials, he said, are very personal. The Lord cuts them just perfectly to fit you and me because he is dealing with us on a personal level. They are our personal trials. And that's the way David treated this. So sensitive to the Lord, he tells Abishai, no, let him throw rocks and curses because I assume this is part of the trial that I'm going through. The prophetic word of Nathan that the sword would penetrate the household of David. And that this... Behavior is part of it. And David accepted it that way. It's a great word of faith. God takes you to a trial. It's a personal trial. Walk it. For myself, I realized 
that my trial was for me. And I said, I'm just going to walk it. I'm not going to say any more about it. I'm not going to pray for any deliverance from it. He's obviously given it to me for a reason. And to this day, I don't know why. Except that it poured steel into my soul. And I think that's what he often does to us. Just pours steel into our souls. Here's what you learn from this incident with this fool, Shimei. He becomes the poster board of the fool in life. Because you see, at the end of David's life, he is counseling. It's the picture of the Godfather. You know, Vito talking to Michael back there in the garden and telling him about things to prepare for. That's what David does with his son Solomon. And that's what you and I need to be doing. Not so much about our estate and our estate plans. Those, those are a very small and insignificant factor. What's really important is you communicate to your children. These are the things that your parents believed. This is the way we have conducted our lives. Remember, your children are not looking for perfect parents. They are looking for real ones. And that's what we want to be, real. These are the things that we embraced. This is the way we conducted our lives. And you need to have those conversations frequently with them so that they understand. They may not embrace your faith today, but they will understand your faith, and God will use that in the future. So here's what David told his son. He says, now after I die, kill him. Shimei. And he lists another, several other names. Get rid of them. Why? What do the Proverbs teach about the king? The righteous king. He winnows the wicked, sifts them out, he runs a threshing sledge over them. Why? Because he was trying to eliminate spiritual problems for Solomon in the future, for his kingdom. You know, Mr. Spurgeon said, when the wicked die, the air grows purer. Well, that was what David was telling Solomon. Purify the air after my death and get rid of these fools that are corrupt. This man never repented of what he did. He just blended in. His mouth was his undoing. Want a lesson from the proverb? Here it is. He was a dead man walking from the day he cursed the king. Now, he thought he had gotten away with it. You know, I asked the question. I wonder what was going through Shimei's mind when he made his way down with the men of Judah to welcome David back to Jerusalem. He thought he had gotten away with it. I'll blend into the crowd. But you don't get away with that. No, the king knows. And ultimately, while you think you're living your life on your own terms and he's grading on the curve, you're under judgment. And he is going to render that ju judgment at a specific point in time. And that is what you have with Shimei. And that's the proverb. Here's 24. The insolent, presumptuous person Mocker is his name. He behaves with insolent fury. The top line heads is about the mocker, 
That's the proverb. And what you have in these lines are the subsequent applied attributes to his life. We open with the word insolent. Here is the way the English translation of Malachi chapter 3 verse 15 uses the word evildoer. And now we call the arrogant blessed evildoer. That's insolent. Not only do they prosper, but they put God to the test and escape, says Malachi. That's Shimei. Thought he had gotten by. He thought God's forgotten. That's what the wicked think. And they're fools. They live like that. They're under the sentence of judgment. This presumptuous person, a verse of our proverb, verse 24, is the one who disregards God. He's presumptuous. What does that mean? He's headstrong. He never has enough. As he's translated in uh, Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 5, as the haughty man. That's the New American Standard. He's never at rest. He's always moving. His greed is as wide as Sheol. That's the grave. What do we learn in the Proverbs about the grave? The grave never has enough. The grave never takes a day off. The grave strikes just as easily at Christmas as it does at Thanksgiving or at New Year's. It always is being filled up. That's what the Proverbs teach. And this man, this haughty man, this evildoer, this presumptuous person, never has enough of anything in this life. And mocker is his name. The term mocker occurs two other places outside of Habakkuk in the Scriptures. First, Psalm 1. Psalm 1 and the second in Isaiah 29, 20. He is the most hardened of the fools. This is the end product of the life of degradation in which he has lived. The world is loaded with them. They're everywhere. And life is all about them. Always all about them. They're incapable of loyalty. See, Stalin, who was a fool, he entered into an agreement with Hitler. Now, Stalin the fool should have known Hitler the fool is never capable of an agreement. He's not loyal to anything. Paper means nothing to him. And so, he disregards it. Neville Chamberlain, hopping off that plane. Great Britain, peace in our time, he says. Who did you make the deal with? You made it with a mocker who's incapable of loyalty. Everything is about me. That's his life. And so... He disregards everything. The most hardened of the fool. He is always at heart a captain of his own ship. And always anxious to promote any and all forms of rebellion. So hard hearted that he in Psalm 1 is the end product of disobeying the word of God. And so he finally just sits. It's a process. Walking, standing, now sitting. He doesn't move. There he is, hard as a rock. The perfect picture of the song of Pink Floyd. I'm not a fan, but I love the title, Comfortably Numb. I've often wondered... Will I ever be able in the providence of God to get this story in a message 
Now I've got my opportunity. <laughs> Dan Duncan had presided over my daughter's wedding in Los Angeles. So we flew out. And the next day, we were in the airport waiting to fly out. And we both went to the magazine store. He was over there looking at the newspapers. I was on the other side looking at the magazines. Suddenly, a man comes right up next to me and says, don't look now, but I think that's Roger Waters. Well, I wouldn't know Roger Waters if he <laughs> bit me in the face. But it, after doing some research, I found out Roger Waters is the lead singer for Pink Floyd. Okay? I didn't know that. But Now, if I were a righteous man and I were a wise man, I would have said, no, oh, he's just a pastor that's a friend of mine. By the way, do you know the Lord? No. But I'm not a righteous man, and I'm not a wise man. And so I thought this was a magic moment that Providence had put in my lap. So I said, hold that thought. And I walk to the other side of the store. Dan's looking down at the newspapers. I'm standing next to him. I give it five, ten seconds. I walk back over and I said, I think you may be right. <laughs> he's from, he's a Britisher. He goes, oh my! Do you think I could get his autograph? I said, you know how these personalities are. <laughs> So, there is a young man in the world that thinks he actually met the lead singer of Pink Floyd or saw him in a magazine. <coughs> Why would I want to rob him of the truth? <laughs> I got that story in. Amazing. Here's the uh, second use of it. It's Isaiah 29:20. 20. God scoffs at the mocker, and he will soon disappear. He behaves. You see, he behaves is his way, the way he's lived out his life. And look at these final two words, insolent, which we've already had before in line one because it's repeated, and then fury. I can still remember this verse, this proverb. I memorized it decades ago. The final words here, the way I memorized it, he behaves with overweening pride. Now, I've thought about that. I thought about it when I was back translating this verse, and I thought, overweening. Now that's a translation committee if I ever heard it. A bunch of English professors. Who talks like that? Overweening. We don't talk like that in Dallas. He behaves with overweening pride. No, here's what the word means. That he is a rebel. He is a mocker. He is a fool. And his behavior is such. That's his heart. That's his mind. And look at the word fury. It means judgment upon this man, upon his soul. Permanently, he thinks he's important. He behaves like he's important. But in fact, he's under judgment, just like Shimei. And so Job... It's not surprising. In chapter 40, in verse 11, he prays, Unleash your fury, Lord. Your wrath, Lord. 
upon this man and bring him low. Now that is what happens to the man of overweening pride. And that's the mocker. He's a short timer. His day is coming. And it's not far off. He will be destroyed like putting a piece of tissue paper in front of a blast furnace. That is the proverb. And that's the Word of God. Here's 25, another fool. The craving of the sluggard kills him because his hands refuse to work. The longings of the lazy here. Without income, no crops, nothing to eat. The familiar slugger. He's the subject of both lines right here. Opposite of the diligent, the ant, back in Proverbs 6. Instead of doing, this man refuses to do. Now, before we get into the details of the proverb, I want to show you something that... I think will help you in interpreting Proverbs because we often read them and say, wonder what this means. Well, look at the final portion, the final clause. It's translated either because, that's your NIV, or you may have the preposition for. Now I point that out, because or for, in good Bible study, they explain. So now we're going to pay attention to the clause because they're going, it's going to explain what the proverb is saying. I just throw that out. I thought it would be helpful. Now, look at line one. We open the cravings. Now, we've studied this word before. It's the word desire. It's Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6. The woman speaking to the serpent. Now she's looking at the tree and she sees the fruit. And here's our word. She desires this, thinking it be good for food. She thinks it will make her wise. A lie. Specifically, here's the way the lexicon translates craving, desire, appetite, covetous. And it references for us Psalm 106 and verse 14. Here is a familiar text. If you keep up with the Israelites in the wilderness and they're wondering, they complained to Moses using this word. They wanted their previous fare, the way they ate back in Egypt, desired, craved for the leeks, the onions, the garlics. They're not here. They're not in the wilderness. So the word carries the idea of something that's empty, that's crass. It promises one thing in the mind, but in fact, it's something entirely different. That's your word. Look at the sluggard. We know him as the lazy bones. He has insolence, his wickedness, his consequence of his lifestyle, his way is death. I understand this term to refer to spiritual as well as physical death. Now look at line two. Because, as we said, that's a clause of explanation. Look at this. His hands. Now the hands are a figure in the proverb for, ex for work, exertion, effort. And look what it says. Refuse. Now let me give you that word, and I think it'll become very clear to you. It's used in 2 Kings 5.16. Here's the story. Naaman the leper, 
He's a Syrian general. He comes seeking to be cured of his leprosy. And the prophet Elisha tells him to dunk himself seven times in the Jordan. And when he comes up the seventh time, he'll be cured. Well, reluctantly, he finally did it. And so overjoyed that he makes his way back to the home of Elisha the prophet. And he has silver and gold and clothes. All the accoutrements that you can imagine that a Syrian general could put together. And he wants to give him a gift. Now, here's your word. Elisha refuses. That's your word from the proverb. No. No. So what does this word refuse mean? It means a conscious choice. He makes a decision for himself. That's what the word is. Now, we better understand this person, don't we? His way is a rebellious heart. And apart from repentance, well, his life is filled with constant friction and frustration. Here is the clear teaching of the Word of God about this subject of work. It's 2 Thessalonians 3.10 from the Apostle Paul. Whoever does not work should not eat. What is so significant about that short phrase is simply this. Your public testimony is you. It's what we think about you. And your testimony is what you do because what you do comes from the heart. The way you speak, the way you use your hands, your feet, whatever. It is you. And you know what the Bible says. What does the proverb says? That your name, your reputation, is far more valuable than silver and gold. Now the world does just the opposite. The world doesn't care about your name. The world cares about the silver and gold. And thus they live lives of frustration and friction and worldliness. But we value our name. We value our reputation because that is who we are. Name and life. They cannot be disassociated. And that's the proverb. There's 26. The more of this foolish person all day long, he craves greedily. But the righteous gives without sparing. Again, underscoring the sluggard's further pathetic life by having really nothing to share. The righteous are elected before the foundation of the world. We are the living witnesses, the living testimony in space and time of the resurrected Christ. People see you. They don't see Him. They don't read their Bibles, but they see you. They listen to you. So you are the living representation of Him. And here's the way the Apostle Paul explains that for us. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 6. We live to the praise of His glorious grace which He has blessed us in the Beloved. That's your testimony. That's what people see. That is the new living life that the Lord Jesus has given to us. And our lives are to be lived for the glory of our Father in heaven. So as for living, our purpose is a grand one. It's an eternal one. A big portion of that display is demonstrating 
that we live contrary to the world, to the world and to the world's principles. What is the world's principles? Build your wealth. Show everyone that despite what they formerly thought about you, you're really a big winner. Look what you drive. Look where you live. Look at the clubs that you associate with. Look at the people you know and that know you. That's the way the world lives. But the life of the believer is entirely different. Rather than focusing on building here, we're interested in building there. We're interested in the kingdom to come. We're just passing through. We just live in tents. We're sojourners. We live day to day unto Him for the glory of God. So we ask the question, what has the Lord put into my hands that I can further His kingdom for today? Because today is all I've got. I don't have tomorrow. I don't have next week. I've got today. What can I do today? And that's your testimony. That's what people know you as and for. And you know what happens when you live for Him? You're actually in the midst of daily blessing. Instead of constant frustration, you're in a life of fulfillment. This is your purpose. The apostle told you that. To the praise of His glory. Now you've found true happiness. And it's not in what you drive or where you live or who recognizes you or your importance or your influence. It's here, inside. You're a different person. And look at this fool craves, he desires his appetite of covetousness. The verb in this form, the action is really upon oneself. Literally, it is he craves for himself. We translate this as greedily or craves and craves. King James translates it covets greedily. The grammar adds to the intensity. This is his life. This is the way he lives. He covets for himself. So here's your contrast. But look at the righteous. The righteous people, on the other hand, they're giving. They have an open hand. They're gracious in all things. Without sparing. That's what the way they live. They don't hoard. They live out daily. And they give. They give time. They give energy. They give money. They give. They're constantly giving. That's the life of the believer. That's the testimony of the believer. You want to be wise? You give. You give all the time. You're constantly giving. What can I do for you? How can I serve you? That is happiness. That is blessing. That is wisdom. And that's skill. And your name is associated with your testimony. And you're living for a great kingdom that no one can see, taste, smell, hear, but is more true than your next breath. That's the proverb. And that's the Word of God. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for our time of study this morning. Thank you for the joy that we have to live for a great King, a mighty and awesome King. And Lord, we are so grateful that we're in this relationship with You because it is not for today, but it is for eternity. And You have us, and You will never separate Yourself from us. 
That's what you promised. And that's what we believe. And believing, that's the way we live. In Jesus' name, amen.